But Foresight CFO is all about you know the financial freedom, and we, we invented the growth CFO from traditional CFO work. But a lot of times, traditional CFO work is really accounting, right? It's not it's not what we would call CFO work. So to distinguish A from B, we we call it growth CFOs, and growth CFOs are different, right? They're more they're more the the, the people to people, right? We're, we're, we're going to go on a, you know, the full journey with the CEO all the way to where they have succession options. So they get that second payday and financial freedom. Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Business Ninjas. I'm here today with Kirk McLaren. He's the CEO of Foresight CFO. Kirk, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm, it can be happy that you invited me to come out and share my story. Yeah, excited to have you. So, Kirk, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, the, um, I mean, how did I get here today to be doing this is, um, you know, I grew up, I live in Bethesda, Maryland now, but I grew up in Houston. So if you hear an accent, if I say y'all, that that's where it's coming from. <laughs> and, you know, just typical kid in the suburbs growing up, good family, mom was a school teacher, dad was a salesman for micro op, optic equipment and um, pretty good older brother, younger sister, pretty good life. And for whatever reason, like starting out on middle school and high school, just a love for business was always if if somebody had a good idea, even if it wasn't me, I wanted to to go do it. So by by high school, um, opened my first business. We had fifteen hundred customers, you know, doing you know, you can imagine Houston's pretty hot. So we had fifteen hundred customers in Houston doing lawn maintenance. Right. But that's a lot of customers and seventy five employees and land. That kind of thing, and then uh, literally sold the business. So just kind of fell into it. Sold the business, went to Texas A&M for a few semesters, and that's way back when the first Gulf War started, right? You remember back in 1991. And um, what else would a kid from Texas do, right? So I mean, I'm in school. The war started, so I dropped out of school and joined the army. I, I joined the army as a behavioral scientist. And that was really kind of an anchoring, you know, my, my whole thing, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a growth CFO finance guy, financial freedom guy, but my whole thing is about people, how to get people to their destination by a lot of times taking off their self-imposed limits. And that, so the behavioral science work for three years in the army, really helping people go beyond in, in different, you know, difficult situations, is you know, kind of a cornerstone of who, you know, who I am today, uh, left the army, went finished grad school, uh, went to Venezuela. In Venezuela, I met somebody, my future wife, Najadee McLaren, and came back. And over a couple of years, we made a couple of kids, you know, two sons who are both military officers now. And then I was always working in private businesses for other people. And then um, I mean, all kinds of businesses from government contracting to technology, education, Himalayan salt companies in Pakistan, all, just all kinds of stuff. And um, roughly eight, nine years ago, things came together. I started teaching at Georgetown University, so even more about developing people. The military experience, better way of doing stuff. Like a, a lot of times in private businesses, they're not clear on the destination. Where are we going? Why is that outcome important to you? And it's not clear, more or less doing the, the day-to-day stuff. Uh, so the, the military experience, how to really work with teams, using better equipment, teaching, and then you know three decades of experience building businesses uh, all came together and I said, started to realize, huh, yeah, I, I, I was at the CFO level for private companies, built, sold different companies, whatever, and then it, it all came together. I was like, huh, there's a group of companies, good business owners who are underserved by the type of clarity that a growth CFO could bring in, into the world. So really on a, you know, on a hunch, started Foresight CFO. That's fantastic. And, you know, just uh, going back to, you know, your past in the army, you know, I appreciate both your service, your son's service. I have two brothers that are Marines. So that's, that's near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate that. But so, you know, kind of diving into a little bit more about Foresight CFO, tell me a little bit more about, more about the business. Yeah. Foresight CFO, it's all about, you know, the financial freedom and we, we invented the growth CFO from traditional CFO work. But a lot of times traditional CFO work is really accounting. Right, it's not it's not what we would call CFO work. So to distinguish A from B, we 
we call growth CFOs. And growth CFOs are different, right? They're more, they're more the, the, the people to people, right? We're, we're, we're going to go on a, you know, the full journey with the CEO all the way to where they have succession options. So they get that second payday and financial freedom. With, with financial freedom, we, we focus on freedom of time mm-hmm. and they gain freedom of purpose. You know, so it's um, that we that our niche is that financial side of it. how do we get from destination outcomes, where are we at now, what's the financial flight plan, and what are, what are we doing in the business to to get that outcome, and how do we make sure we can see with confidence what's working and what's not working, so that team members, you know, the 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 clients, employees can take the right action at the mm-hmm. right time. So so we invented the growth CFO, and you know we we have team members globally doing this work. And we, we needed a way, well, how do how do we have team members globally work as one team working with clients who are global, right? Including that that Pakistan Himalayan salt company. And that and I was in the military, and let me tell you someplace I'm not going, right? I, I've done that. So um so so over the last few years, our, we created a platform and it, it's emerged we're now grow CFO, that now there's a financial freedom platform that you know business owners can run their entire business on and and the growth CFO is kind of the driver to orchestrate that to guide the teams to you know to, to use it even better. So it's the same kind of approach, destination, where are we at, what's the flight plan across the business. We're we're not chief marketing officers, but we work really well with them. Like, you know, uh let's make sure they have the right flight plan. Let's make sure they're mining data. A lot of times 80, 20 customer segmentation is not being done well. And so, so an example of that um, I'm going on a little bit here, but I'll, I'll give an example of how we work with the the client acquisition or the customer acquisition team of our of our clients. Um, we, we're good at data, and and we can collaborate with a CMO to see, hey, there's some there's some blind spots that you know if we mine this data, we can we can make even better decisions. An example, we have we have a customer that has fourteen thousand customers. And we started working with them. Hey, I want, what do you want? I want more customers. Okay, fine. When we do the analysis, you know, it's literally 80, 20 does play out for, you know, the Pareto principle where, you know, 80% of the results come from roughly 20% of the, um, the activities. And you can see not, with the customer segmentation, you can see, ah, yeah, these customers, you want more of those, mm-hmm. but the 20% of the bottom, man, they, they don't love you. And there's nothing you're ever going to do. They don't come back very often. They're difficult. They're not happy with you. There's nothing you're going to do to make them happy. Mm-hmm. And then 60% in the middle, well, can some of them move into that top 20%? But the top 20% loves you, right? And the more we dial in to who are they? Why do they buy from us? Why do they keep buying from us? Maybe we can tailor our products to really suit them even better, right? So you're doing more remarkable work with your customers and then bundle things and look at look at the pricing strategy because so that everyone's doing better, right? So that that's just data, a little bit of clarity and the confidence about making the right decision at the right time. And then on the platform, the financial freedom platform, knowing that you can follow through on a project management level for doing something new and seeing that in the KPIs. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh my God, you know, you're flying a plane, you're getting, you know, you're not, you're not just looking out the window to see what, uh, is that Paris? I think so. Okay, turn left. But you got the instruments. You know where you're coming from. You know where you're going to. And you're always over or under you know, team members across the company. And they proactively can make their own adjustments based on what they control without the need for a, you know, the CEO to, to hold on tight. Is that, is that, that's a long-winded way of saying that's what we do. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you know, when you're talking about hiring a growth CFO, when's the right time? How do you how do you know, you know, when as a business owner, when might be the right time to to invest? Yeah, for for the full service, the, the way we work, three person team, ninety day sprints, and we we go across this journey. The full service starts to make sense when somebody's earning five million of revenue and more. We kind of focus on five to fifty million dollars of revenue clients as an entry point and if they want a 2x 3x we're, we're a, at least a good option to talk with below 5 million we have a monthly service so so roughly roughly at the million dollar mark only nine percent of companies ever make it to the million dollar mark and pass so that's a good if you're doing that you're doing lots of things correct a monthly service would make sense if, if you want if you, if you want to go beyond status quo we can help you get to that five million and at five million, at five million, that's there's kind of a black hole between one to five where companies get stuck and they never come out. 
uh, you, you can still do well at a million dollars. You can still do well with a household income and that kind of stuff. But but companies struggle creating the sales, you know, the go to market client acquisition capability and delivery capability, plus all that support infrastructure. They struggle with that. So m many, many get stuck in that one to five million dollar level. Um, then once you know, if you're at five million or more, you know, 15, 20, 20 million, 5, 10, 15, 20 million are good sweet spots. And if you want a 2X, 3X, um, it's probably a good idea to have a growth CFO that's really committed to the, the vision and the passion and roll up your sleeves hands-on with the CEO, business owner, and, and the, their team, right? The, the sales, marketing, delivery. And when we're talking about these clients, do you tend to see trends? I know you talked about kind of where the revenue should be. Do you see trends in the type of industry, um, you know, the the vertical that people, that your clients are potentially in? Yeah, we're, we're industry agnostic. We're, um, if somebody, we're really passionate about people. If a business owner wants to do better, wants to have more confidence, wants to sleep at night and have, a, have the business lead to a meaningful outcome in their life, mm -hmm. right, then, then we're a good bet. Companies like technology companies are they, they definitely get that. Like you know, a lot of technology companies are built to sell, so they're they're kind of into it. Um, and the, the companies that struggle, like construction companies, really you know, construction companies are very like margin low. They're very price sensitive, and they um, they might question how a growth CFO can really help them do better. No, there's a, you know, they, they don't really fully get there might be more money in the bank. So we struggle with those companies. We can do great work with them, but, but they don't, uh, on the outside, they don't, they don't really see it or feel it until they experience mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. But every, uh, you know, technology companies are def definitely good. Um, you know, retail stores, if somebody wants to expand, if it's one store and you're happy, man, that's great. Status quo is great. Don't need us. If you want to, Four, five, six, seven stores of, of, any, of any type, we can help you do that with more clarity, more confidence, and uh, team members able to make the right decisions. So, so pretty much industry agnostic. Uh, in, if they want to, if we're not going to follow through, let's not get started. But if you're going to want to follow through, let's, let's do it. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the ways that Foresight CFO is really able to stand out from its competition is that kind of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I was hearing is that quick 90 day approach for, for really integrating and getting started. Am I hearing that right as one of the differentiating factors? That, that's right. Now, um, we, we, we plan within a multi-year goal, we plan to follow through a 90 day sprint. So we're, we're accountable and we drive accountability and we, we jump in Front stage, we focus on one priority with whatever that pain point is or opportunity is with the, the CEO. And it could be everything we talked about, you know, low financial performance, they're having trouble getting uh, winning new, new customers, whatever it is, we come in and focus on that number one challenge. And then backstage, we're putting in the habits or profitability, which are basically those instruments you can fly the plane, right? You can see better where you're coming from, where you're going to. And then at the same time, we're doing, just like if you go to a doctor, they might run tests before they decide what they think or what they know is going on, like do the blood work and do the x-ray. We, we do the same thing. We have a financial health check, roughly 20 to 40 hours backstage. We don't want to miss something, mm -hmm. right? If there's a kink in the hole somewhere, we want to be able to see it. Be it that might be the priority. That might be the root cause. Uh, if, if not, we... We, we developed the flight plan. At what future point might that be the number one opportunity or challenge to tackle? But we do that through, there's five diagnostics and one financial health check, and it's all backstage. But we don't want to put any more weight on the shoulders of the, of the people in the company because most people already have have plenty. But that that's our cadence. Um, mm -hmm. Front stage, uh, we huddle every week. We're, we're hands-on accountable to follow through. Our, we the, the growth CFO is working front stage with this the CEO business owner, but that CFO our CFO has two other team members doing certain things backstage. But, it, but it's very clear and clean. Um, weekly huddle, monthly we re review the financial scoreboard. Every quarter we have a quarterly impact where we step back, work on the business together, and we're driving accountability right across the company for ourselves and. You know everybody else, and the kink in the hose. No judgment. Let's just see it. You know the numbers was hey, that's not. That's where we're stuck. So let's mm -hmm. see it, and let's let's you know cross the team. Let's take action mm -hmm. to to get back in flight. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, besides obviously hiring a growth CFO, once you first kind of that 90 day sprint that, you know, that really intense holding yourself accountable, do you have one piece of actionable advice or a trend that you tend to see an issue in that you could give our, you know, our listeners just to say, hey, you know, here's a little bit, just something to maybe to take a look at or consider um, in, in how to move forward? Yeah, the, the, the trend, almost without exception, you, you have smart business owners who are very successful. They're, they're really good at what they do. Almost without exception, they with, with financial information, they get wrapped around the axle. It literally, it literally makes them feel not smart because while they're, they're smart in this area, but they look at these documents and all of a sudden, you know, they, they don't feel good about themselves. So they, you know, naturally, what would I do if I don't feel good about something? I avoid it. I and look at financials once a year when it's tax time and what a missed opportunity, right? Be all that clarity. So, so it's, so that's almost without exception. That's the case with, um, with most non-financial people. And so we work, make it easy. Like the same way when I teach Georgetown, you know, they come in with big eyes, think I'm going to give them a calculus test or something, but just we slow it down, yeah. do things side by side. Start setting the habit just without even, without even second guessing. Let's just start meeting every month. Look at the financial scoreboard. And all of a sudden, it, by month three, it's starting to make ah. By month six, the same person, it, it, the business owner, all the way to their managers, wouldn't make a decision without knowing where they stand. Mm -hmm. Right? What's the what's the number story? Where's their variance? Why? And where do they take action? Mm -hmm. So it's, by by month six, it starts to become really deeply ingrained. Uh, mm -hmm. Month three, it's like okay, it's, it's kind of getting there. Um, and what a life changer that is when it's not, you know, it's not just the controller, the counter person is looking at financials, but the team, it lines the team, same sheet. Okay, we're over or under what we expect. It's fine. No judgment to see, see things with clarity. Then the team members start proposing where to take action. So now you're unlocking all this know-how, all this skill, and they they own it. If they're, they see it, they take action, preferably take, they, they can see it. Maybe every day, maybe maybe every week, if the, if everything's built into like a daily dashboard, they wake up, they log in, they can see, oh, red, green, yellow. I'll take action there, and then you can see the outcome in the monthly financials. Hey, we're on we're on plan, or if we're not, that's fine. So that that's kind of the feel. So we really slow it down because for for all the right reasons, except for the engineers, they like spreadsheets, but everybody <laughs> else like man, right? You, you yeah, get, right. Uh, let's let's avoid. Let's do everything. Let me go wash the car, cut the lawn, do this, everything except look at the financials. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, you know, and and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm wondering if a common misconception about the industry may be that, you know, uh, I, I'm good at what I do. I started my company. I've been able to do that but I can't necessarily tackle that, that financials. So working to hire, you know, a growth CFO being the next step, but, you know, being feeling like maybe they're not necessarily in the right spot to finally hire a growth CFO. What would you say, you know, would be a common misconception? Yeah, I think, I think a lot, a lot of times if a lot of times business owners are actually ashamed of their kind of back office financials, right? And they, they express it, right? They're, everything else is so good because what they're good at is, is clean and done well in their business, but they know they have this other part. Like one, one business owner at we're not we're not tax people, but one business owner didn't have didn't file his taxes for six years, right? So he kind of knows you know there's a ticking time bomb out there, uh, or it's just not it's not organized. Or in another thirty million dollar company, good sized company, only a very small percent of people ever make that level, but they they had a good like management system, but they had no they didn't even have an account accounting system like there was none. Right, so that so the tax preparer is doing things off the bank statement. So you, you can just imagine. To me, that's not it's not bad. It's an opportunity. Imagine how much better. Man, you got a business of thirty million. You're profitable, and you got your household income. Uh, how much better could you be, as far as decisions at the right time, right decision at the right time, and when you want to pass, if, if we do this now, when you want to pass the torch, you want there's there's seven succession options. Which one? has the right financial outcome when you're financially free, you get that second payday, you're financially free forever. If we start now, uh, we, you can do that in a way that's tax optimized and you hit your number, right? Uh, versus, you know, flying relatively blind. And then you, you go to sell your business and people look at it and like, ah. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. That's why, that's why like almost 70% of deals fall through just because it's, 
you know, you open the you open the hood of the of the car and it's where, where's the engine? And it's rusty. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, interesting, Kirk. Well, you know, I think this has been a very insightful conversation. As we start to wrap up, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with, whether it be advice, you know, more about the industry, about financial freedom, anything that you want to leave our listeners with? Yeah. I, I think the main thing is li- literally embrace it. Like, like, it's, you know, figure out your destination. What, what, what do you care about? Who's around you? Feel it. Who's around? What is it? What does that mountain look like? You know, when you're, we're at the summit, what does it feel like? Who's with you? How's your family? Do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? I mean, really get to where you feel it because that will tell you whether it's worthwhile to, you know, figure out the flight plan and do the work, maybe add a growth CFO to your team. Um, in our case, growth CFO who's using the financial, we have a technology financial freedom system, so it's really, really well worked out. Um but if the, if the destination, if the status quo is good, and you're, yeah, you know, making household income. If, if, when I'm ready to step back from the business, if no one will buy it, I'll just close it. If that's, if that's a good outcome, then uh, okay. Well, terrific. Well, Kirk, you know, I really appreciate all of your insights, your guidance, you know, looking forward to, you know, having our listeners reach out to you about hiring, you know, a growth CFO, utilizing your platform, you know, to make to make those you know financial changes to, like you said, you know, really accelerate the the, the growth of the company and, you know, operationalize it. So, you know, I think this has been a terrific conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on Business Ninjas today. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me. I look forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. Great to have you.